square kilometers or 7.8 plus uh, million square miles. It is the fourth largest open ocean on the planet, dwarfing the Arctic Ocean. So what's the difference between those two? As you can see here, the Arctic Ocean is surrounded by land, whereas the Southern Ocean, with the Antarctic continent in its middle, is surrounded by the Southern Ocean. Basically, the Southern Atlantic, the Southern Pacific, the Southern Indian Oceans. Uh, and you can see the respective sizes. The Southern Ocean is substantially larger, almost than the uh, Arctic Ocean. And both of these share similarities in that they have massive amounts of sea ice. So if we look at the <coughs> Southern Ocean, we're in this sector over here, of the Scotia Sea, as we come down onto the South Shetland Islands and then the peninsula itself. And if we're lucky, we may see a little bit of the Weddell Sea, this general area on the east side of the peninsula. So let's take a look at the oceans itself. Uh, in the first instance, the Southern Ocean is defined by this subtropical convergence. We'll talk about the subtropical convergence a little bit. Basically, it's a temperature change between the tropical and subtropical regions. And then we'll take a look at the Antarctic Convergence or the Antarctic Polar Front, frequently referred to simply as the Polar Front. This separates the subtropical waters from the subantarctic waters, and the, it is the major biological boundary of the Southern Ocean. Everything south of this boundary is more productive. We have much more life in the oceans than we do in the northern portions. In other words, the cold water areas are far more productive biologically than are the warm areas of the, uh, of the oceans. So then the Arctic and the Antarctic have much more biological activity than the tropical regions on the planet. And finally, we'll take a look at the Antarctic divergence, which we find that uh, we have the east wind and west wind drink, uh, drifts converging. Most of the circulation in the southern oceans is clockwise around the con sorry, clockwise around the continent, driven by the west wind. In other words, all the water is being pushed east, and the east wind all the water being pushed to the west. And that's what uh, is taking place at the Antarctic Diversions. It will be particularly important for the upwelling of nutrients uh, on the continent, at the edge of the continent. So we've been in uh, Ushuaia over here, and we've crossed the Antarctic to the Antarctic Peninsula. And what we're looking at is the sub-Antarctic zone. We have a transition zone which is roughly midway between Ushuaia and the peninsula, and then we have the Antarctic zone. And that's basically as we're crossing the Drake, it looks quite like this today. And what we should begin to do is keep an eye out for bird populations. The uh, Cape Petrel is one that we're likely to see, particularly if we get a little closer to the continent. But you should be looking for various uh, albatross, prions, and petrels as we cross. This is an excellent time to look for the seabirds that uh, have been talked about by Peter. So sometimes we get wonderful sunrises or sunsets in this area. So let's talk specifically about the subtropical convergence. <clears throat> It's a temperature drop from about 6 degrees Celsius or 11 degrees Fahrenheit that takes place at this boundary. And it's the northern limit of the Southern Ocean. It defines the boundary, northern boundary of the Southern Ocean, where the subtropical waters to the north meet the subpolar or subantarctic waters to the south. So if we're looking at the sub 
tropical convergence is outlined by that red line. I'll give it to you again. It's all the way around here. And you can see we've been in the Southern Ocean since leaving Ushuaia down here at the bottom of South America. And we'll be in it the rest of the time, virtually until we leave um, the, uh, the uh, Maldives or Falkland Islands. So the Antarctic Convergence, or polar front, is the biological boundary of the Southern Ocean. It's the boundary between the polar and subpolar waters. And it changes somewhere between 50 degrees and 60 degrees south latitude. So we'll take a look at that in just a moment. Uh, the Antarctic circumpolar current, the cold water, is going clockwise around the continent and it meets the subpolar subantarctic waters, which also are going in that way. It's defined by a temperature drop of about 3 to 6 degrees Celsius, or 5 to 11 degrees Fahrenheit. And as I say, south of that border is biologically extremely uh, productive. Uh, it's a transition zone which ranges, depending on the time of year, from 20 to 100 nautical miles in width. So a few years ago, a colleague and I <coughs> traversed uh, the Drake Passage on four different occasions, and we took measurements, water measurements, uh, of the temperature drop over this polar front. And you'll see we did it in mid-November, mid-December, January, and February. On the left side, you see the sea temperature scale here, and the sea temperature is starting somewhere between five and seven degrees Celsius, and it drops eventually down to zero or minus zero, below zero, uh, in, as we proceed during the, uh, the season. So if I take one, let's take one example from mid-November. Uh, you'll see it starts at about 50, roughly 56 degrees south latitude, and over a degree, a little more than a degree, it drops, as you can see, from about almost six degrees Celsius, drops down to zero degrees Celsius, and that takes place roughly from 56 to 57 degrees south latitude, a little bit more. As we As we progress through the year, you notice the temperature drop, for example, in mid-December, a month later, it is slightly further south when that takes place. And finally, by early February, where we start with a temperature close to six and a half or seven degrees Celsius, it begins to drop at around 57 degrees south latitude, but doesn't complete its drop in temperature until almost 61 degrees. So there's a huge difference in the length of time that drop takes place in temperature. I'm sorry, I'm not doing that. This, um, whereas here it drops at about one degree uh, of latitude, here it takes several degrees of latitude to get to the same place. Now the shift takes place, as you can see, from November to December to the red is January and then February, all of this begins slightly further south as the season progresses. And if you think about it, as summer temperatures warm up the waters, the waters warm gradually from north to south, and the waters are slightly warmer by the end of summer, and hence the drop in temperature at the polar front is later in the season. The Antarctic Convergence, or the polar front that we've been talking about, where this temperature drop is roughly 6 degrees Celsius, or about 11 degrees Fahrenheit, is outlined by this circle. Coming in with the temperatures right there. And you'll notice all of the circulation of the ocean at this point is clockwise around the continent. This is the major biological boundary and then we go on to the Antarctic divergence. And I have the clicker. Is that okay? Go. Let's see if that's good. Uh, so
so everything south of this boundary, <clears throat> going toward the continent, is the most biological active and productive area around the continent. So let's think about the anti-divergence. <clears throat> the third thing we talked about at the beginning. It's a boundary between the east and west rifts. The continental waters, <clears throat> that is the continental waters of Antarctica, meet the polar surface waters. It's a very high salinity. It's generally quite deep. It's very nutrient rich with the nutrient rich waters coming down from the Arctic Ocean down the North and South American coasts and upwelling in the Antarctic to provide the nutrients for the increased productivity down there. And those, of course, mix with the melt glacial meltwaters from the Antarctic ice sheet, in this case, West Antarctic ice sheet. I think I mentioned before that the Antarctic is sometimes considered a single ice sheet and sometimes an east and west ice sheets, two ice sheets, divided by the transcontinental mountains, transantarctic mountains. So if we look at the divergence, it's the boundary indicated here between the east and west wind drifts. The west wind drifts going clockwise around the continent, and the east wind going counterclockwise around the continent. So if we look at the cross-section of the various currents here, the first thing we notice is that the Antarctic divergence comes here with the east and west wind drifts. And the winds coming off the continent are taken up in the easterlies, and the easterlies move all the water to the west. So that's this general zone in here. And then as you go offshore, you bump into the westerlies, and the westerlies drive the water to the east, as is diagrammatically shown here. You notice that coming off the continent, the waters are very cold. They deep become the deep waters, as you see here. And they meet the waters uh, coming, I'm sorry, these are the bottom waters, basically, from the continent. And the deep waters coming down from the Arctic Ocean along the North and South American East Coast upwell here, and they're bringing all sorts of nutrients into this zone, which means there's lots of biological activity at that area. And we'll see that as we come close to the continent. We'll see an increase in bird populations. We'll see seals and whales uh, in those areas, primarily feeding on the nutrients that have come up from the deep ocean currents that have come all the way from the Arctic Ocean down the coast of North and South America. So if we look at the topography of the Southern Ocean, you'll see that there are lots of deep blue areas here, which are the basins that surround much of the area. And the uh, yellow and, and red colors are some of the ridges. Uh, these are all below the surface, obviously, but some of them portrayed at the top. And we're concerned basically about this general area in here. We're coming across from South America to the Antarctic Peninsula. And those two bodies have been separated by a plate, a small plate, the scope of plate, which comes through this area and extends out to the edge of the South, uh, South Sandwich Islands out here. So this is a subduction zone out here. This has been tearing apart the extension of the Andes. You recall the Andes come down this way and originally were uh, connected basically to the same mountain range that makes up today's peninsula. Uh, so this is the general area we'll be in. We may get to a little bit of the Weddell Sea which extends over into this area, uh, but we'll have to see as we go along. Uh, remember we're embracing vagueness because we of ice conditions or wind conditions, storm conditions, we don't know exactly where we're going to be able to go. But as we come across, you should be looking out for the various albatrosses. The, uh, many of you already have seen the black brown uh, albatross. Uh, in this case, the wandering albatross is one that's a little more rare. It's the largest of the albatrosses you're likely to see here. So let's take a look at the currents. The Antarctic circumpolar current 
flows, as I've already indicated, clockwise around the uh, Antarctic, with its center somewhere around 53 degrees south latitude. It's driven by the west wind drift, the water moving east. Remember, we talked about this as we looked at South America. We've just come from uh, the, the southern Pampas and the Patagonia, and those are areas that are semi-arid to arid. And that's because of the westerly winds. The westerly winds come off the Pacific, they hit the Andes, they drop most of their moisture there, at least they rise, precipitation takes place in the form of rain or snow on the western flanks of the Andes, and then the winds coming over the Andes are basically dry which meant where we just were in Patagonia and the Southern Pampas uh, is an area to semi-arid area. As we go down further south, we begin to get easterlies in the atmospheric circulation, and just the reverse would be true, which if you look a little further north in South America, in Chile, for example, the Anaconda Desert on the west coast of Chile is caused because all the rain is precipitated, all the moisture is precipitated on the eastern flanks there because the eastern winds are blowing to the west. And when they hit the mountains, precipitation takes place and the opposite side on Chile uh, becomes the desert area. Okay, so these flow uh, clockwise around the Antarctic, as I've said before. They're driven by the west wind drift uh, it extends north to the subtropical convergence. In other words, it moves from around 50 or, or more degrees south all the way up to where the Southern Ocean starts. And the converge of the subtropical convergence where we have the warmer tropical waters meeting the colder southern waters. Uh, it extends from the sea surface to around between two and four thousand meters deep. It's a wedge of water that's 600 to 1300 feet in thickness. <clears throat> and we'll see that it takes place right around here. All of this red arrows indicate the circulation of the Antarctic circumpolar waters going clockwise around the continent. So then the next is the Antarctic Coastal Current. It's very narrow, goes counterclockwise around the Antarctic. It's driven by the east wind drift. East wind, in other words, is coming from the east, driving everything in its way to the west. The water moves to the west as a result. And it's approximately 65 degrees south latitude, not quite to the Antarctic Circle. And you can see here that it's going counterclockwise around the continent. And the two are meeting, the west wind drift, the red arrows going around the continent clockwise, and the east wind drift going counterclockwise around the area. So what else do we need to think about besides the circulation? Well, one thing is the various um, ice shelves. An ice shelf is where the glacier, in this case the continental glaciers of the east and west Antarctic ice sheet, are flowing into the ocean. And as they float in the ocean, the ice being less dense than the water floats. So you envision the, the glacier extending all the way down to bedrock, to the rock below, and as that glacier flows out into the ocean, Bedrock is too far below. It's in, it has the ocean in between the bedrock and the surface, and so that floats out into the sea. Uh, two of those ice shelves, the Larsen uh, and the Wilkins ice shelves, which were, the Larsen, as you can see here, was on the the east side of the peninsula in the Weddell Sea side, and the Wilkins was down in this general area, are no longer there. They have been completely melted and flooded.
floated out as a big icebergs to melt into the ocean and cause some rise in sea level as a result. And those have both disappeared within the last 15 years. Uh, the one we're going to be most interested in probably is the Ronnie Filchner ice shelf, which is still in existence, because from this, we've had one of the largest icebergs that broke off about 37 years ago, I think it was, and it was grounded for 37 years. In other words, it was so thick that the bottom actually was on the bottom of the sea and didn't move until this year, this past year. And uh, this is a view of it as of December of, uh, of, of this year, December 23, and it's currently located up here just off the Antarctic Peninsula. So with any luck, there's an outside chance that we may actually hmm. see this. You can see its size is quite enormous. Uh, here's Greater London as an example, uh, which is only 1,500 square kilometers, and this is up at 30 plus uh, thousand square kilometers. That's roughly, incidentally, about twice the size of Manhattan for those of you in the United States. <laughs> so the currents, let's take a look at those. We have two gyres in the ocean, that is, the water simply circle, keeps circling around without joining the main ocean currents. And then there are ways in which the southern ocean flows out into the other oceans of the world. If we look at, at the gyres, there are two. One is the Weddell Sea Gyre, and basically this water simply moves around and around and around in this area, eventually escaping into the uh, Atlantic. And the other major gyre is the Ross Sea Gyre system, which again is circling around in this general area, and eventually will escape out uh, between Australia and New Zealand or up the African uh, coast. So there's the Humboldt Current going up the South American coast. There's a Benguele uh, Current going up the west coast of Africa. And there's the New Zealand Current going between Australia and New Zealand. All of those are parts of the Southern Ocean that ships traverse, that we're traversing in the present from South America to the continent, in this case, the Antarctic Peninsula. So let's look at the main water masses. <clears throat> There's obviously the Antarctic surface waters, uh, very low temperature, relatively low salinity, 34.4 parts per thousand, as opposed to some of the more saline portions that go up to 34.8 or even 35 parts per thousand. So this is relatively low salinity. It's about five, uh, 50 to 200 meters in thickness, roughly 150 to 650 or so feet in thickness. And it proceeds around the Antarctic continent, generally depending where it is, either driven by the east or west winds, but coming directly off the continent, as you can see here, is this zone of surface water. We've already talked about the circumpolar deep water. This is bringing up all the nutrients for the biology that's predominantly found in this zone. And we've talked a little bit about the Antarctic bottom waters, which are the waters coming off the uh, Antarctic continent and being taken below everything in this picture. <clears throat> so the circumpolar deep water, it's the core of the Southern Ocean. It makes up most of the water volume in the Southern Ocean. It comes almost 60% of the total ocean waters in the Southern Ocean system. It's approximately 2,300 meters or about 7,500 feet in thickness. It's, in other words, it's a massive body of water consisting of about 81 million cubic kilometers of water that's moving mostly clockwise around the, the uh, <coughs> excuse me, around the continent or about 
19 and a half million square miles of, uh, sorry, cubic miles of water. That should be a cubic, I'm sorry, not square miles. <clears throat> so if we look at that general thing, here's the Antarctic convergence, that's the biological boundary, you'll remember. And down here is the Antarctic divergence separating the counterclockwise east winds from the clockwise west winds drift. So this is the massive amount of water that's coming as the <clears throat> nutrient rich deep water upwells, bringing all of the nutrients from the Arctic Ocean and all along the east of the coast of North and South America down to the Antarctic. Those waters upwell with all sorts of nutrients in, which means that the phytoplankton and zooplankton will thrive. And they, of course, mean that the entire food chain of Antarctica is going to blossom. It's going to explode. It's going to be a massive biological uh, body that's taking place in that area. The bottom water, the Antarctic bottom water, is only 28% of the Southern Ocean system. So that's, now we've, we've gone roughly 80% or almost, a little more, almost 90% of the ocean waters itself. It's arbitrarily defined as the water with temperatures less than zero degrees Celsius or 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, remember, they just don't freeze because of the saline content. To get waters with a saline content that's 34.4 uh, or more uh, parts per thousand, you're going to need temperatures of minus two Celsius, one and a half to two, or two and a half Celsius, depending on the saline content, or temperatures down to roughly 28, 27 degrees Fahrenheit before that would freeze, and the water temperatures are not that low. So the water does not freeze, primarily because of the saline content that's there. Saline content in most of this area, the densest water in the open oceans, is around uh, 34.8 per, uh, parts per thousand. Uh, that's not potable, potable to uh, us. We would not be able to withstand that type of saline content in the, in the water. Um, and it's overlain by the Antarctic circumpolar water. So if we look at, at that, uh, we're talking about this section, the bottom water here, overlain by the circumpolar water coming down from the north, which is upwelling, in this case, bringing the nutrients, as we indicated. And of course, at the surface, we have the uh, Antarctic surface waters in play. And that those surface waters are separated by the uh, east and west wind drifts and that's where the Antarctic divergence occurs. Now the other thing that's happening, of course, uh, as we're, uh, the further north you are, the more uh, solar radiation is coming in and heating the ocean. And as it proceeds south, it loses much of that heat. And when we get down to the polar regions, either in the north or south, we have much colder waters than we do at the tropics where the input, heat input is greatest into the, the oceanic waters. Now when the waters get to the poles, you'll notice that the cold water goes, to, goes down. And of course, that's an area covered by ice. We may see this. We may not. I don't, I, the last ice charge would indicate that we probably will not see this the view with the uh, much of this area covered by first year sea ice. Uh, we'll probably see isolated patches of that as we get down to the continent. So the circulation of the Southern Ocean, uh, we've already talked about with the circulation of a west wind drift clockwise around the continent and the east wind drift counterclockwise around it. The nutrients have come up here and that means there's lots of productivity biologically. 
So this shows the phytoplankton, that's the vegetation type things. We're talking about algae, for example, with single cell uh, algae. They're coming up and you can see by the intensity here around the continent, the red and orange areas are where we have tremendous amounts of, of productivity of the phytoplankton. The phytoplankton, of course, are eaten by the zooplankton. And particular interest is are the krill. Now remember the krill are almost the bottom of the food chain. The seals rely on them, some penguin species rely on them, the baleen whales rely on them, and so on. Many of the fish species rely on them. So this is a critical critter, critical almost shrimp-like critter that you can see here. It gives you an idea of the size held out in a hand. Uh, as the bottom of the food chain. And what's happening as the sea ice melts, the food for the krill is diminished. Why? Because at the bottom of the sea ice is where the phytoplankton, the algae, for example, are, and that's where the krill feed. And as that ice vanishes, there is less food available for the krill. And that's one of the reasons the krill, as a mass of group, is diminishing. Uh, there's another reason, of course, it's also being uh, exploited by mining, because the krill is then processed and used as feed for fish farms, particularly the salmon fish industry. Uh, with the warming temperatures, two things are happening. One, the sea ice is melting. The food source, relatively speaking, for the krill is diminishing. Number one and number two, as it increases in temperature, it means that some of the species have to move to cooler portions of the ocean because they cannot survive the different temperatures. Most of the marine species live in a very narrow temperature range. And that temperature range as it warms means they need to move further south or in the northern hemisphere further north to survive. That's related in part to the melting of the sea ice and obviously to global warming. So if we look at the Antarctic food web, you'll see that we have the phytoplankton down here. Many of those are living on the bottom of the sea ice. That's the ice that's floating in the ocean, having nothing to do with glaciers. It's just frozen seawater. Uh, and the krill feed on the phytoplankton. And you can see in this illustration, the krill are uh, the food source for many seals, birds, fish, squid, elephant seals, penguins. Uh, some of the baleen whales and some of the smaller toothed whales all rely on the krill. So let's review. In the Southern Ocean, the subtropical convergence, everybody remembers what that is, right? That's where we have a temperature drop of about 6 degrees Celsius, 11 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's the beginning, the northern limit of the Southern Ocean. So as soon as we left Ushuaia and the Beagle Channel and got out into the open sea, we were in the Southern Ocean. Second, probably the most important thing from a biological viewpoint is the Antarctic Convergence or the Polar Front. There's a sudden temperature drop, which I showed you some illustrations of, that takes place during spring, summer, late summer, almost into autumn. Uh, of somewhere between 3 and 6 degrees Celsius or 3 to 5, 11 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the biological boundary of the Southern Ocean with enormous increases in biologic activity to the south. Birds, whales, seals, squid, everything is enormously enhanced at that boundary as we move forth further to the south and we have a huge number of uh, uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, a large, large number of food sources and nutrients coming into play, which permits the massive explosion of biological activity. And we have the Antarctic divergence, which is the boundary between the east and west winds in the area, uh, which contribute, this, this is the zone where many of the nutrients from the north that upwell from the deep of the oceans come right up against the the continent. And that's the circumpolar deep water that is upwelled with enormous amounts of nutrients just around the perimeter of the Antarctic continent. That's where we're headed. That's where we'll be seeing seals, whales, birds. Probably won't see the fish unless you've got x ray vision, but they're there. And krill, you may or may not. You probably will not see from the ship, but uh, there'll be masses of krill in portions as we, of the ocean as we come through the Antarctic uh, Peninsula boundary. Circulation of the Southern Ocean, as I have indicated, is clockwise. The mass of water is clockwise around the continent with, with less, uh, much narrower counterclockwise current system taking up about 28% uh, of the water, whereas this is taking up close to 60% uh, of the ocean water circulation patterns. So we're likely to see some icebergs. I think you should be on the lookout for those starting late afternoon, early evening tonight and tomorrow. There's a chance of spotting an iceberg that's floating off of the uh, peninsula and the off into the South Shetland Islands. And if we're lucky, uh, right now I notice it was a little cloudy out there, but if we're lucky we may see a sunset like this. So what I hope I've been able to do is give you some understanding of the ocean that we're traversing right now. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, because there is something going on at the Gatsby, I'll be outside on the sixth level here on the port side. Uh, just outside the door as you exit if you have any questions. Thank you very much.